Set your affections on things above, not on things of this earth. John Owen, Chapter 4 Other evidences of thoughts about spiritual things arising from an internal principle of grace, in which they are an evidence of our being spiritually minded, the abounding of the thoughts, how far and where in such an evidence. The second evidence that our thoughts of spiritual things proceed from an internal fountain of sanctified light and affections, or that they are acts or fruits of our being spiritually minded, is that they abound in us, that our minds are filled with them. We may say of them, as the apostle does of other graces, if these things be in you and abound, you shall not be barren. It is well indeed when our minds are like the land of Egypt in the years of plenty, when it brought forth by handfuls, when they flow from the well of living water in us with a full stream and current. But there is a measure of abounding which is necessary to evidence our being spiritually minded in them. There is a double effect ascribed here to this frame of spirit. First, life. And then, Peace. The nature and being of this grace depend on the former consideration of it, namely its procedure from an internal principle of grace. The effect and consequence whereof is life. Peace also depends on this degree and measure of the actings of this part of it in our spiritual thoughts. And this we must consider. It is the character of all men in a state of depraved nature and apostasy from God that every imagination of the thoughts of their hearts is only evil continually. Genesis 6, verse 5 All persons in that condition are not swearers, blasphemers, drunkards, adulterers, idolaters, or the like. These are the vices of particular persons, the effects of particular constitutions and temptations. But thus it is with them, all and every one of them, all the imaginations of the thoughts of their hearts are evil, and that continually. Some as to the matter of them, some as to their end, all as to their principle. For out of the evil treasure of the heart can proceed nothing but what is evil. That infinite multitude of open sins which is in the world gives a clear prospect or representation of the nature and effects of our apostasy from God. But he that can consider the numberless number of thoughts which pass through the minds of every individual person every day, all evil, and that continually, he will have a further comprehension of it. We can therefore have no greater evidence of a change in us from the state and condition than a change worked in the course of our thoughts. A relinquishment of this or that particular sin is not an evidence of a translation from this state. For, as was said, such particular sins proceed from particular lusts and temptations and are not the immediate universal consequence of that deprivation of nature which is equal in all. Such alone are the vanity and wickedness of the thoughts and imaginations of the heart. A change herein is a blessed evidence of a change of state. He who is cured of a dropsy is not immediately healthy, because he may have the prevailing seeds and matter of other diseases in him, and the next day die of a lethargy. But he who, from a state of sickness, is restored, temperature of the mass of blood and the animal spirits, and all the principles of life and health, to a good crisis and temperature, his state of body is changed. The cure of a particular sin may leave behind it the seeds of eternal death, which they may quickly effect. But he who has obtained a change in this character, which belongs essentially to the state of depraved nature, is spiritually recovered. And the more the stream of our thoughts is turned, the more our minds are filled by those of a contrary nature the greater and more firm is our evidence of a translation out of that depraved state and condition. There is nothing so unaccountable 
as a multiplicity of thoughts of the minds of men. They fall from them like the leaves of trees when they are shaken with the wind in autumn. To have all these thoughts, all the several figments of the heart, all the conceptions that are framed and agitated in the mind to be evil, and that continually, what a hell of horror and confusion must it needs be. A deliverance from this loathsome, hateful state is more to be valued than the whole world. Without it, neither life, nor peace, nor immortality, nor glory can ever be attained. The design of conviction is to put a stop to the thoughts, to take off from their number, and thereby to lessen their guilt. It deserves not the name of conviction of sin, which respects only outward actions, and doesn't regard the inward actings of the mind. And this alone will, for a season, make a great change in the thoughts. Especially will it do so when assisted by superstition, directing them to other objects. These two in conjunction are the rise of all that devotional religion which is in the papacy. Conviction labors to put some stop and bounds to thoughts absolutely evil and corrupt and superstition suggests other objects for them, which they readily embrace. But it is a vain attempt. The minds and hearts of men are continually minting and coining new thoughts and imaginations. The cogitative faculty is always at work. As the streams of a mighty river running into the ocean, so are the thoughts of a natural man, and through self they run into hell. It is a fond thing to set a dam before such a river, to curb its streams. For a little space there may be a stop made, but it will quickly break down all obstacles or overflow all its bounds. There is no way to divert its course but only by providing other channels for its waters and turning them there in two. The mighty stream of the evil thoughts of men will admit of no bounds or dams to put a stop to them. There are but two ways of relief from them, the one respecting their moral evil, the other their natural abundance. The first is by throwing salt into the spring as Elisha cured the waters of Jericho, that is, to get the heart and mind seasoned with grace. For the tree must be made good before the fruit will be so. The other is to turn their streams into new channels, putting new aims and ends upon them, fixing them on new objects, so shall we abound in spiritual thoughts. For abound in thoughts we shall, whether we will or not. To this purpose is the advice of the Apostle in Ephesians 5, verses 18 and 19. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When men are drunk with wine unto an excess, they make it quickly evident what vain, foolish, ridiculous imaginations it fills their minds with. In opposition to this, the Apostle advises believers to be filled with the Spirit. To labor for such a participation of Him as may fill their minds and hearts as others fill themselves with wine. To what end? To what purpose should they desire such a participation of him to be so filled with him? It is to this end, namely, that he by his grace may fill them with holy spiritual thoughts, as on the contrary men drunk to an excess are filled with those that are foolish, vain, and wicked so the words of verse 19 declare, For he advises us to express our abounding thoughts and such duties as will give an especial vent to them. Therefore, when we are spiritually minded, we shall abound in spiritual thoughts or thoughts of spiritual things. That we have such thoughts will not sufficiently evidence that we are so unless we abound in them. And this leads us to the principal inquiry on this head, namely, what measure we ought to assign to this, how we may know when we abound in spiritual thoughts. 
so as that they may be an evidence of our being spiritually minded. I answer in general, among other scriptures, read over Psalm 119 with understanding. Consider therein what David expresses of himself as to his constant delight in and continual thoughts of the law of God, which was the only means of divine revelation at that season. Try yourselves by that pattern. Examine yourselves whether you can truly speak the same words with him, at least if not in the same degree of zeal, yet with the same sincerity of grace. You will say, that was David, it is not for us. It is not our duty to be like him, at least not to be equal with him. But as far as I know, we must be like him if ever we intend to come to the place where he is. It will ruin our souls if, when we read in the scripture how the saints of God express their experience in faith, love, delight in God, and constant meditation on him, we grant that it was so with them that they were good and holy men, but it is not necessary that it should be so with us. These things are not written in the scripture to show what they were, but what we ought to be. All things concerning them were written for our admonition, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. And if we have not the same delight in God as they had, the same spiritual mindedness and thoughts and meditations of heavenly things, we can have no evidence that we please God as they did, or shall go to that place where they are gone. Profession of the life of God passes with many at a very low and easy rate. Their thoughts are, for the most part, vain and earthly. Their communication unsavory and sometimes corrupt. Their lives at best uneven and uncertain as to the rule of obedience. Yet all is well. All is life and peace. The holy men of old who obtained this testimony that they pleased God did not so walk before him. They meditated continually on the law, thought of God in the night seasons, spake of his ways, his works, his praise. Their whole delight was in him, and in all things they followed hard after him. It is the example of David in particular that I have proposed. And it is a promise of the grace to be administered by the gospel that he that is feeble shall be as David, Zechariah 12, 8. And if we are not so in his being spiritually minded, it is to be feared we are not partakers of the promise. But that we may the better judge of ourselves therein, I shall add some few rules to this direction by way of example number one. Consider what proportion your thoughts of spiritual things bear to those about other things. Our principal interest and concern, as we profess, lies in things spiritual, heavenly, and eternal. It is not, then, a foolish thing to suppose that our thoughts about these things should not hold some proportion with those about other things, nay, that they should not exceed there. No man is so vain in earthly things as to pretend that his principal concern lies in that in which he thinks very seldom, in comparison of other things. It is not so with men in reference to their families, their trades, their occasions of life. It is a truth not only consecrated by the testimony of him who is truth, but evident also in the light of reason that where our treasure is, there will our hearts be also. And the affections of our hearts act themselves by the thoughts of our minds. Therefore, if our principal treasure be as we profess, and think spiritual and heavenly, and woe to us if it be not so, on them will our affections and consequently our desires and thoughts be principally fixed. Yet we may the better examine ourselves by this rule. We must consider of what sorts men's other thoughts are, and as to our present purpose they may be reduced to these heads. Number one, there are such as are exercised about their callings and lawful occasions. These are numberless and endless, especially among the sort of men who rise early and go to bed late, and eat the bread of carefulness, or are particularly industrious and diligent in their ways. 
These thoughts men approve themselves in and judge them their duty as they are in their proper place and measure. But no heart can conceive the multitude of these thoughts, which partly in contrivances, partly in converse, are engaged and spin about these things. And the more men are immersed in them, the more do themselves and others esteem them diligent and praiseworthy. And there are some who have neither necessity nor occasion to be engaged much in the duties of any special calling, who yet by their words and actions declare themselves to be confined almost in their thoughts to themselves, their relations, their children, and their self-concerns, which, though most of them are very impertinent, yet they justify themselves in them. All sorts may do well to examine what proportion their thoughts of spiritual things bear to those of other things. I fear with most it will be found to be very small, with many next to none at all. What evidence, then, can they have that they are spiritually minded, that their principal interest lies in things above? It may be it will be asked whether it be necessary that men should think as much and as often about things spiritual and heavenly as they do about the lawful affairs of their callings. I say more and more often, if we are what we profess ourselves to be, generally it is the best sort of men as to the things of God and man, who are busied in their callings, some of one sort, some of another. But even among the best of these, many will continually spend the strength of their minds and vigor of their spirits about their affairs all the day long. And so they can pray in the morning and evening with some thoughts, sometimes the spiritual things occasionally administered. They suppose they acquit themselves very well, as if a man should pretend that his great design is to prepare himself for a voyage to a far country where is his patrimony and his inheritance? But all the thoughts and contrivances are about some few trifles, which, if indeed he intend his voyage, he must leave behind him. And of his main design he scarce thinks at all. We all profess that we are bound for heaven, immortality, and glory. But is it any evidence we really design it? If all our thoughts are consumed about the trifles of this world, which we must leave behind us, and if we have only occasional thoughts of things above. I shall elsewhere show, if God will, how men may be spiritually minded in their earthly affairs. If some relief may not be obtained, I cannot tell what to say or answer for them whose thoughts of spiritual things do not hold proportion with, yea, exceed them, which they lay out about their callings. This whole rule is grounded on that of our Savior in Matthew six thirty one, thirty three, and 34. Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. When we have done all we can, when we have made the best of them, we are able all earthly things as to our interest in them amount to no more but what we eat, what we drink, and wherewith we are clothed. About these things our Savior forbids us to take any thought, not absolutely, but with a double limitation as first, that we take no such thought about them as should carry along with it a disquietude of mind, through a distrust of the fatherly care and providence of God. This is the design of the context. Secondly, no thought that, for constancy and engagement of spirit, should be like to those which we ought to have about spiritual things. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let that be the principal thing in your thoughts and consciences. We may therefore conclude that at least they must hold an exceeding proportion with them. Let a man industriously engaged in the way of his calling try himself by this rule every evening. Let him consider what have been his thoughts about his earthly occasions, and what about spiritual things, and thereon ask of himself whether he be spiritually minded or not. 
Don't be deceived. As a man thinks, so is he. And if we account it a strange thing that our thoughts should be more exercised about spiritual things than about the affairs of our callings, we must not think it strange if, when we come to the trial, we cannot find that we have either life or peace. Moreover, it is known how often, when we are engaged in spiritual duties, other thoughts will interpose and impose themselves on our minds. Those which are about men's secular concerns will do so. The world will frequently make an inroad on the way to heaven to disturb the passengers and wayfaring men. There is nothing more frequently complained of by such as are awake to their duty and sensible of their weakness. Call to mind, therefore, how often, on the other hand, spiritual thoughts interpose, and as it were impose themselves on your minds while you are engaged in your earthly affairs. Sometimes, no doubt, but with all that are true believers it is so. Or ever I was aware, saith the spouse, my soul made me as the chariots of Aminadab, Song of Solomon 6, verse 12. Grace in her own soul surprised her into a ready, willing frame to spiritual communion with Christ when she was intent on other occasion. But if the thoughts of heavenly things so arise in us, bear no proportion with the other sort, it is an evidence what frame and principle is predominant in us. There are a multitude of thoughts in the minds of men which are vain, useless, and altogether unprofitable. These ordinarily, through a dangerous mistake, are looked on as not sinful, because, as it is supposed, a matter of them is not so, and therefore men rather shake them off for their folly than their guilt. But they arise from a corrupt fountain, and woefully pollute both the mind and conscience. Wherever there are vain thoughts... There is sin, Jeremiah 4, verse 14. Such are those numberless imaginations in which men fancy themselves to be what they are not, to do what they do not, to enjoy what they enjoy not, to dispose of themselves and others at their pleasure. That our nature is liable to such a pernicious folly, which some of tenacious fancies have turned into madness, we are beholden alone to our cursed apostasy from God and the vanity that possessed our minds thereon. So the prince of Tyre thought he was a god and sat in the seat of God, Ezekiel 28, verse 2. So it has been with others, and in those in whom such imaginations are kept to some better order and bounds, yet being traced to their original, they will be found to spring some of them immediately from pride some from sensual lusts, some from the love of the world, all from self, and the old ambition to be as God, to dispose of all things as we think fit. I know no greater misery or punishment in this world than the debasing of our nature to such vain imaginations, and a perfect freedom from them is a part of the blessedness of heaven. It is not my present work to show how sinful they are, let them be esteemed only fruitless, foolish, vain, and ludicrous. But let men examine themselves what number of these vain, useless thoughts night and day rove up and down in their minds. If now it be apprehended too severe that men thoughts of spiritual things should exceed them that are employed about their lawful callings, let them consider what proportion they bear to those that are vain and useless. Do not many give more time to them than they do to holy meditations, without an endeavor to mortify the one or to stir up and enliven the other? Are they not more wanted to their seasons than holy thoughts are? And shall we suppose that those with whom it is so are spiritually minded? There are thoughts that are formally evil. They are so in their own nature, being corrupt contrivances to fulfill the desires of the flesh in the lust of it. These also will attempt the minds of believers. But they are always looked on as professed enemies to the soul and are washed against. I shall not, therefore, make any comparison between them and spiritual thoughts, for they abound only in them that are carnally minded. 
The second rule to this purpose is that we should consider whether thoughts of spiritual things constantly take possession of their proper seasons. There are some times and seasons in the course of men's lives in which they retire themselves to their own thoughts. The most busied men in the world have some times of thinking to themselves, those who design no such thing as being afraid of coming to be wiser and better than they are, do yet spend time therein whether they will or not. But they who are wise will be at home as much as they can, and have as many seasons for such their retirements as is possible for them to attain. If that man be foolish who busies himself so much abroad in the concerns of others that he has no time to consider the state of his own house and family, much more is he so who spends all their thoughts about other things, and never makes use of them in an inquiry how it is with himself and his own soul. However, men can hardly avoid but that they must have some seasons, partly stated, partly occasional, in which they entertain themselves with their own thoughts. The evening and the morning, the times of waking on the bed, those of the necessary cessation of all ordinary affairs of walking, journeying, and the like are such seasons. If we are spiritually minded, if thoughts of spiritual things abound in us, they will ordinarily and that with constancy possess these seasons. Look upon them as those which are their due, which belong to them. For they are expressly assigned to them in the way of rule, expressed in examples and commands. See Psalm 16, verse 7. Deuteronomy 6, verse 7. If they are usually given up to other ends and occasions, are possessed with thoughts of another nature, it is an open evidence that spiritual thoughts have but little interest in our own minds, little prevalency in the conduct of our souls. It is our duty to afford to them stated times, taken away from other affairs that call for them. But if instead of this we rob them of what it is, as it were, their own, which no other things or business can lay any just claim to, how dwells the love of spiritual things in us? Most professors are convinced that it is their duty to pray morning and evening, and it is to be wished that they were all found in the practice of it. But if ordinarily they judge themselves in the performance of that duty to be discharged from any further exercise of spiritual thoughts, applying them to things worldly, useless, or vain, they can make no pretense to be spiritually minded. And it must be observed which will be found to be true that if the seasons which are, as it were, due to such meditations be taken from them, they will be the worst employed of all the minutes of our lives. Vain and foolish thoughts, corrupt imaginations, will make a common haunt to the minds of men in them, and habituate themselves to an expectation of entertainment whence they will grow importunate for admission. It's with many those precious moments of time which might greatly influence their souls to life and peace, if they were indeed spiritually minded, make the greatest provision for their trouble, sorrow, and confusion. For the vain and evil thoughts, which some persons accustom themselves to in such seasons, are or ought to be a burden upon their consciences more than they can bear. That which providence tenders to their good is turned into a snare, and God does righteously leave them to the fruits of their own folly, who so despise his gracious provision for their good. If we cannot afford to God our spare time, it is evident that indeed we can afford nothing at all, Micah 2 verse 1. They devise iniquity upon their beds. The season proper for holy contemplation they make use of to fill their minds with wicked imaginations, and when the morning is light they practice it, walking all day on all occasions suitably to their devices and imaginations of the night. Many will have cause to complain unto eternity of those leisure times which might have been improved for their advantage to eternal blessedness. If we intend, therefore, to maintain a title to this grace of being spiritually minded, if we would have any evidence of it in ourselves, without which we can have none of life or peace, 
and what we pretend thereof is but an uh, effect of security, we must endeavor to preserve the claim and right to spiritual thoughts to such seasons and actually put them in possession of them. Consider how we are affected with our disappointments about these seasons. Have we by negligence, by temptations, have we by occasional diversions or affairs of life be taken off from thoughts of God, of Christ, of heavenly things, when we ought to have been engaged in them? How are we affected with a view of this? A carnal mind is well enough satisfied with the omission of any duty, so it have the pretense of a necessary occasion. If it has lost a temporal advantage through attendance to a spiritual duty, it will deeply reflect upon itself, and it may be like the duty the worse afterward. But a gracious soul, one that is truly spiritually minded, will mourn under a view of such omissions, and by every one of them is stirred up unto more watchfulness for the future. Alas, it will say, how little have I been with Christ this day. How much time has passed me without a thought of him? How foolish was I to be wanting to such or such an opportunity? I am in arrears to myself and have no rest until I be satisfied. I say, if indeed we are spiritually minded, we will duly and carefully call over the consideration of those times and seasons in which we ought to have exercised ourselves in spiritual thoughts. And if we have lost them, or any of them, mourn over our own negligence. But if we can omit and lose such seasons or opportunities from time to time, without regret or self-reflection, it is to be feared that we wax worse and worse. Now the way will be made hereby for further omissions until we grow wholly cold about them. And indeed, that woeful loss of time that is found amongst many professors is greatly to be bewailed. Some lose it on themselves by a continual track of fruitless, impertinent thoughts about their own concerns. Some in vain converse with others, in which for the most part they edify one another unto vanity. How much of this time might, nay, ought to be redeemed for holy meditation? The good Lord make all professors sensible of their loss of former seasons, that they may be the more watchful for the future in this great concern of their souls. Little do some think what light, what assurance, what joy, what readiness for the cross or for heaven they might have attained had they laid hold on all just seasons of exercising their thoughts about spiritual things which they have enjoyed who now are at a loss in all, and surprised with every fear or difficulty that befalls them. This is a first thing that belongs to our being spiritually minded. For although it does not absolutely or essentially consist in them, yet it is inseparable from it, and a most undeceiving indication of it, and thus of abounding and abiding in thoughts about spiritual things such as arise and spring naturally from a living principle, a spiritual frame and disposition of our hearts within. End of chapter 4. John Owen